So in this second half of our video, we're going to talk about the details of photosynthesis. We're really going to go into how the light reactions and the Calvin cycle work. So recall as we left off from part one that these little green circles represent pigments. Uh, these are pigment molecules embedded within a larger protein photosystem. Uh, when I look at the next picture again, all you're going to see is the giant photosystem, and I want you to think that there are the pigment molecules inside that are actually capturing the light energy. So here is that picture. We see that there are two photosystems that sort of work in pairs with each other. There are actually lots of copies of these proteins throughout the thylakoid membrane, um, so they're only showing you two here, um, but all of them work in pairs. Um, it's a little um, irritating uh, how they're named, I'm afraid. Um, the initial photosystem is actually named photosystem 2. The next photosystem in the whole dis uh, process is named photosystem 1. That had to do with the order of their discovery. I'm not going to refer to them by those names. I'm just going to call them the initial photosystem and the next photosystem uh, because I think that that is a bit crazy. So I'm going to start over here at the initial photosystem. Um, notice that both of them um, can capture light energy. So when light energy comes in, both of them can capture it with the pigments that are embedded inside. And when either photosystem absorbs light energy and the pigments have electrons, then they can absorb that light energy and boost those electrons to high energy states. Whenever either photosystem does that, the electrons um, are captured by the photosystem. So that's what they're showing you with these arrows here. So maybe the pigment is sort of like down there. Um, and when it's excited by light, it's rising in energy and the photosystem grabs it and sends it somewhere else. Over here in this other photosystem, maybe there's a pigment down here. The pigment absorbs light. Here is the electron being boosted in energy, and the photosystem also grabs it and sends it somewhere else. And whenever a photosystem does that, it essentially leaves a hole in the pigment. Um, the, uh, we, we sometimes refer to it as a hole, so uh, those pigments need new low energy electrons if they're going to repeat the process. And ideally in photosynthesis, plants want to um, have the pigments continuously absorb light and constantly be making new high energy electrons to power the process. So in this initial photosystem, that's going to require water. Um, water's job is to come in and deliver new low energy electrons to the initial pigments of the initial photosystem so that they can absorb light and energize new um, uh, elect high energy electrons. So when water does this, it comes in, it drops off the electrons, and it actually leaves as oxygen gas and separated hydrogen ions. So it actually kind of splits up entirely. Um, this uh, process has a name that's worth mentioning. It's called photolysis. Um, so it's like uh, light energy is driving the splitting up of water. Um, because light is coming in and energizing electrons, that's creating the hole uh, in the pigment for water to want to come in and drop off new low energy electrons and leave as oxygen and, and H+. So that's how the initial photosystem gets new low energy electrons. Um, we'll discuss in just a minute how the next photosystem gets its new low energy electrons. So let's go ahead and follow the path of this initial photosystem then. So um, the pigments absorb light, boost their electrons in energy state, and then the photosystem grabs them and sends them to the electron transport chain. So this is, in many ways, the same electron transport chain as we saw in respiration. The electron transport chain is a chain of, of transport proteins that can use the energy of those high energy electrons to power the active transport of H pluses um, in one direction. So once again, we're pumping H pluses to one side. Um, as it turns out, the direction of the pumping is different than in respiration. Um, in this case, the protons are actually being pumped in, uh, out of the stroma into the innermost space. Um, so they're actually being pumped in in the light reactions of photosynthesis. 
Um, those H pluses, once they build up in concentration, can do the same thing that we saw in respiration. Um, this next step over here, chemiosmosis, um, is when those H plus ions, those protons, um, diffuse back from high to low concentration by going through ATP synthase. And as they do so, remember that that represented an electrical current. Um, that help the ATP synthase protein power the combination of ADP and phosphate to make new ATP. So um, we've made the ATP. That was one of the goals of the light reactions. So um, let's go back to what happened to those electrons. Those electrons were powering the electron transport chain. Um, and here's another kind of important difference between the light reactions and respiration. What happens to those low energy um, spent electrons at the end of the electron transport chain? Remember that in respiration we had to have a molecule like oxygen come in and grab it to get rid of it. As it turns out here in photosynthesis, oxygen isn't necessary because there's a protein that can grab it and actually give it to the next photosystem. The next photosystem has a hole in it, remember, because maybe its electrons were boosted in energy, grabbed by the photosystem, and sent somewhere else. So now its pigments need access to new low energy electrons, and it gets them right from the old electron transport chain. So that also makes it uh, oxygen unnecessary. So a nice little recycling system here. And as long as light energy is available again, um, it will take those electrons, boost them up in energy once again, and put them to useful work. Uh, what can this next photosystem do with high energy electrons? It can actually um, have them go directly to uh, an electron carrier like NADP, can come in, grab the electrons, and turn into NADPH. So we really need two things for the Calvin cycle. We need NADPH, high energy electrons, and we need ATP energy. Um, this diagram doesn't show it, but it's worth briefly noting that the high energy electrons of the next photosystem can actually go back to the old electron transport chain and help create more ATP. Um, so they can actually go back here and um, help pump H pluses once again. Those H pluses can help create new ATP. And then those um, electrons, once they run out of energy, can go right back into that next photosystem again. Um, so your book calls this the cyclic electron flow because they're actually kind of going in a little circle. Um, why does that happen? Because as we're going to see in the next um, step, the Calvin cycle, it actually requires a little bit more ATP uh, than it requires NADPH. So sometimes we just need to make a little bit more ATP, so we might send them back to the electron transport chain on occasion. All right, that's a lot of details, but don't worry, the light reactions is by far the, the biggest step of photosynthesis for me that I want you to know. So I, did, I decided to provide a text summary once again. Feel free to pause the video if you'd like to uh, help you take notes about this. Um, where do the light reactions take place? That whole diagram I just showed you, we were assuming took place in a eukaryotic autotroph, um, like a plant. And we said that for them, the light reactions are a series of proteins embedded in the thylakoid membrane. That's the inner membrane of the chloroplast. Remember that prokaryotes can also do, uh, can also do photosynthesis. Excuse me. So they just have those same set of proteins embedded in the cell membrane. How does the light reactions work? Here's a broad summary. Um, we talked about the role of chlorophyll pigments and how they get the process started, energizing their electrons. Remember that the photosystem takes them away so that there's sort of a hole left to be filled. Um, but we can put those high energy electrons then to work. How? We can really do two things. We can use them to power H plus pumping, active transport, the electron transport chain. Eventually that produces energy in chemiosmosis when those H pluses diffuse back through ATP synthase. The other thing uh, the electrons can do, high energy electrons, is they can be directly captured. 
We talked about the holes that were in the pigments. So how do pigments get new low energy electrons so that they can absorb light again and make new high energy electrons? For the initial photosystem, they need uh, water. That's the reason plants want water so badly from the soil, is they want to make sure that their photosynthetic centers can constantly be um, f uh, fed with low energy electrons from water. Where does the next photosystem get electrons? From the electron transport chain. All right, and if that was a lot of detail, it might be really good to go back to this review. Um, we see that the broad goal here is for light energy to come in and be eventually converted to two forms of chemical energy, ATP and ADPH. That's the broad goal of the light reactions. All right, so we're ready for the Calvin cycle now then. How does the Calvin cycle work? Uh, the Calvin cycle is going to take that ATP, take that NADPH, and one further uh, chemical, carbon dioxide, and it's going to try and build sugar. So um, there are actually a lot of sugars floating around in the liquid. Um, we're going to see that the Calvin cycle takes place within the stroma um, of the chloroplast for eukaryotes. For prokaryotes, it's just going to take place in the cytoplasm. Um, and if carbon dioxide is available, then some of the sugars that are already floating around can be combined with the carbon dioxide. Um, so kind of a big sugar is going to combine with um, even more carbons and eventually make an even bigger sugar. Uh, this sugar over here admittedly doesn't look very big, but that's because that bigger sugar is very unstable and almost immediately splits up into lots of these little sugars. Uh, these little sugars um, then can be phosphorylated um, with ATP energy, um, and that helps um, uh, convert them with the help of high energy electrons into this sugar. Um, what's important about this sugar is that uh, most of them just go back um, to finish the process and repeat. A little bit more ATP is spent over here. Um, and that turns them back into this sugar that can combine with even more carbon dioxides and repeat the process. Uh, but the important part of the Calvin cycle is that if we had carbon dioxide available, then some of that sugar will sort of float away free. Um, that sugar is now available to the cell. That's the sugar that we've produced in photosynthesis. Um, unfortunately, this diagram calls it G3P, um, so technically um, two G3Ps um, can easily combine and make one glucose. So um, if three turns of this cycle can make one G3P, then six turns of the cycle can make one glucose. That's not a very important detail to me. Um, you can really just think of the Calvin cycle as making glucose. So here's a broad summary of the Calvin cycle. Uh, where is it taking place? And what broadly is going into it? We need carbon dioxide to add carbons to get new sugars. We need ATP energy to help convert the sugars to other sugars. We need high energy electron energy. So you might ask, why make all this sugar? Um, some of it will just go right back into a mitochondrion in the plant to make ATP. Um, if it seems a little bit of a waste of time to make ATP in the light reactions to make sugar and then just send that sugar to respiration to make ATP again, I agree with you. That does seem like a bit of a waste of time. Uh, but don't forget that sugar has many purposes within an autotroph. Uh, autotrophs, by and large, don't eat. So they're going to have to build all of the macromolecules that make up their cells. So sugar doesn't just sort of, um, isn't just used to make other carbohydrates, um, but some of that glucose made in photosynthesis can be sent to other metabolic pathways, um, like with um, extra nitrogen and sulfur sources from the soil, um, we could make amino acid monomers out of sugars. Uh, we could send sugars to other metabolic pathways, and with sources of nitrogen and phosphorus from the soil, we could make nucleotide mon monomers. So um, there's lots of different purposes for glucose, not just to burn it again to make ATP. And that's really it. Um, that's a broad summary of the Calvin cycle um, and the light reactions. Um, and I'm hoping you can walk me through both steps, um, focusing more of your attention on the light reactions.